are honored to have Professor K. Nishimoto to give a talk for us on Japanese sensitivity of space. Professor Nishimoto is the Associate Dean of the College of Architecture, and he is also the President of the Japanese American Society of San Antonio. Today he will be talking about, I said this already, the Japanese sensitivity of space. Uh, Professor Nishimoto was born in Japan, in uh, Osaka, 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 Japan. And he got his bachelor's degree from Waseda University. He received his master's degree from Cornell. Uh, he worked in Amsterdam before. He also worked in Tokyo, in New York. Um, Professor Nishimoto has taught at several universities, including uh, Columbia University, Pratt Institute, both in New York. He also was a visiting professor at Temple University and UT Arlington. Um, he taught at Texas A&M University as well. He joined UTSA in 2007 as a professor and the associate dean for graduate studies. Space really comes with a sort of uh, uh, desire on my side to describe what is unique about Japan uh, from my discipline point of view. But uh, rather than talking about the technical or two academic aspects of okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, two academic aspects of the Japanese architecture of space, I thought. Uh, something very fundamental about uh, how the Japanese sort of culture and people perceive the space, and it really comes uh, with the fact that Japan is an island. There are other countries in the world, that, uh, Taiwan is one, uh, England, you know, et cetera, but Japan maintains very unique in the sense that it was never occupied by the different uh, cultures, so to speak, although. The, the cultural history really is about sort of a repetition of importing the culture uh, from a more advanced uh, countries such as China uh, or Europe, later on, et cetera. And then there is a period that the, the whole thing becomes Japanese, so to speak. And so uh, the sort of, you know, the, the dichotomy between what makes Japan really unique from that point of view and how those things are simulated into the sort of core of the Japanese sensibility is what I, uh, I try to describe. So, uh, now, like I said, it's really an island. And the myth 
which was a uh, historical record in the 8th century, in fact, in Chinese language, because that was a sophisticated language to record uh, all the sort of ancient days of Japan. Uh, the story goes that these two um, uh, divine uh, entities, they were not necessarily called gods, but those were, they had names, Izanami and Izanaki, and they decided, why don't we create a country, a world, and we're going to place the spear into the uh, water and then stir a little bit. And that's how the Japanese myth says the country emerged. Uh, <clears throat> and so the, the whole thing sort of not, uh, you know, that it would be a sort of recurring theme that in the Japanese very core sensibility that something happens and it's sort of, it's not a singular event, but it can happen. Uh, in a sort of context that it uh, sort of, you know, the, the context is right, or situation is right, that, that something like an island, something like a world can be born uh, in a symbolic way, rather than that is the only moment that the beginning of the history begins. Uh, so there's a set of circle size related to the myths, and the, the sort of, sort of near the Issa shrine, which uh, is the most sacred shrine in, in Japan, and this sort of celebrates those two uh, uh, babies, so to speak. Now, <laughs> centuries pass, so to speak, and um, the, the Japanese uh, domestic aspect, especially in the uh, uh, course of their aristocracy, they would, like Italian Renaissance did, they would uh, come up with this ideal villa, so to speak, the ideal living situation, and that uh, it, uh, uh, consisted of this uh, water that uh, this is a oops, sorry. This is, uh, this, is, uh, this is sort of a <coughs> formal uh, hall, and then there is a living quarter, and then there is this whole water outside with an island uh, in the middle, and uh, and that sort of made uh, the most logical or sort of essentially. Uh, uh, most uh, the relevant world made for them to think that their living is really a sort of at the edge of the water, just like the entire country and the, uh, and the, the island is surrounded the water. And these are the buildings, not necessarily uh, exactly a reminiscence of uh, the, those villas, so to speak, uh, but in these different uh, uh, buildings from the same period, that you can see that this most uh, Sort of celebrated uh, structure where they would be sitting down and then reading the books, etc., and having a party. And there would be this water with an island that you can see at the distance, and that's how they thought they would contemplate the, the significance of the world, etc. Now, these, uh, these uh, uh, female aristocrats, uh, so to speak, uh, they would, I will be discussing this later, but uh, this is how they thought the, the world making uh, of their domestic party. Like I said, there is this uh, you know, party at Laos, and this is from the golden area here. This is where they would be coming out to enjoy the, the looking back into the building from the, from the pond, from, from, from the water, on top of the water. Now, the style obviously changes, and Zen Buddhism would be imported from Japan again, but uh, in Japan, what happened was this sort of current theme of making the water or symbolizing certain uh, elements. Like the water with an island uh, would become a sort of recurrent theme, and so you would be sitting obviously on this side, and this is uh, the, the Zen garden that you would be contemplating. And the, the, the interesting thing is that for, from the Japanese uh, point of view, or this is you know, uh, really sort of necessarily related to the Chinese uh, Zen culture, but the world really is how you would be sort of uh, uh, looking at the situation. So therefore, there is no contradiction, so to speak, that you have this uh, you know, uh, fence around it, and there is a gate that you can't really go through. Uh, uh, as a part of the world. In other words, that it's it's not necessarily within this. And this is okay. I may, I don't want this sound too uh, too difficult to describe this thing. But in the Western way of uh, understanding the space, it's really uh, always that there is a space here, and this this space will be divided into parts. And that's how 
the rooms and the buildings and the cities are uh, you know, constructed. In Japan or in this context, it's really from this point, from this point that the world uh, you know, uh, becomes uh, bigger and the sort of interaction with the other part would make the, the special understanding. So when you are when you're here, obviously it takes time for you to be staring at you know the, at the, the relationship and why has the circle necessarily here the relationship with the other, etc. In this way, and how the sort of cosmic world was, I guess you know contemplated in their way. And these uh, patterns are obviously done every day. On the other hand, you can also see that this is sort of a representation of the island and uh, the other world. Maybe this is where the humans uh, occupy. There is another world that is also uh, uh, civilized or represented in the form of these islands. Again, but the fact that this is inside of the uh, fence, and you know, you're not looking at this thing as a whole, uh, as a whole to understand how the world is. It's really here to here to here to from here to there, etc. Is how the space is. And therefore, it's uh, obviously it's very possible to have the completely different scale, uh, so to speak, the size that the same uh, temple has this very famous, very narrow Zen garden, which is like this is three feet wide, and this has this, uh, you know, the world of uh, the, the sea, so to speak, water and the island. And here is Yorangi, which is the most celebrated uh, Zen garden of all, and there are 15 of uh, these rocks composes uh, the, the whole uh, space, and it's not known who exactly did this. There's a story that the sort of gardeners, two gardeners, brothers, sort of came up with this thing, but apparently, <clears throat> if you really try to find all 15 of them from any angle, you can't. There are there, you can only see 14 of them. One is always hidden somewhere. What does that mean in terms of sort of the conceptual nature of the space or you know, Zen uh, philosophy? Uh, we don't really know, but uh, 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 the, the sort of recurrent theme of how <coughs> each uh, stones and rocks are related, not just this, not just one of them or the other one, but how they are related to each other is how the space is conceived, so to speak. Now, when you look at those things, it sort of uh, looks very, very abstract, and uh, you know, it looks like sort of some of the invention, etc. In fact, in Japan, uh, inside of this bay, inner sea, that there, there is a space called Setoguchi uh, Bay, uh, and there are thousands of small islands. So, from the uh, the people who lived, uh, you know, in the during that period. These are the sort of things they saw, that the idea of the island, this small island that is the sort of representation of the replacement of their conceptual understanding of how the Japan was really born, is always a part of the domestic life, so to speak. And here is a view of that. <coughs> Last summer when we were there, I was there with the students, this whole part, the, the corridor part, the terrace part was under construction. So, uh, you know, there was this big uh, construction out there. You couldn't really see this famous view, but it was also very interesting to see this, some, some stones very near. Uh, uh, under. Now, <clears throat> so I was talking about the sort of relationship between the island to the other island, and that means there's a distance. From here to there, there's this measurable distance. And in Japan, it sort of plays a different role than uh, sort of a you know, scale-wise consistent distance in, in terms of the measurement. And what that uh, uh, sort of example is, and here is uh, another example that you would be looking at the stone garden. But what happens is that, uh, in fact, that in the, this is the same view. Uh, there is this mountain in the background. Uh, that the previous image obviously couldn't show because of the aperture, etc. But um, there is an idea that, uh, well, it's a sort of te technique in the garden making that's called shake. Shake means borrowed scenery. And it was a sort of invented style by uh, aristocrat, an aristocrat who was really into the garden making. So here is this, uh, the world that is really peaceful and it's controlled. 
And then you would borrow the scenery, the, the, uh, the distant uh, mountain, as if it's, it is a part of the garden making. In other words, that you would decide and coordinate the landscape based on what kind of view you can see in the distance. And that also is a sort of relationship between I am here, Japan is here, the island is here, and there is a world that is sort of you know, outside of the boundary uh, you, uh, you are uh, proceeding. <coughs> now, Japan also is an island, and along the sea, where well, all the towns and cities are either uh, you know, based in the sea, or the flat plain of the city is inside of the mountain, around the mountain. Uh, that's where the, the flood plain happens, that's where the rice field occurs. So a lot of cases that uh, the, the image of the space uh, comes with the surrounding mountains in the distance. Sometimes in this mythic uh, shadow and uh, uh, you know, profile, uh, and that's where you don't necessarily go because all these evil spirits are uh, occupy or sacred spirits. Uh, there is something very mythical. Koyasan is one of the most sacred uh, places where this uh, is famous for having this sort of foggy weather every day. And that's where uh, all the, the tombs of the shoguns and the aristocrats are all gathered. And when you go there, this is a kind of daily uh, experience of walking through in the morning when there is a uh, you, etc., that you see as uh, objects surrounding you, and then you may have the sense that there are other things that are not necessarily revealing, but they are there. They're mysterious. Uh, Saihoji is a small, uh, uh, different garden, but they're in Kyoto, in the city, but they try to sort of simulate the kind of experience that you will find on top of the mountain. <coughs> Now, so for some painters, like uh, Tohaku, in this case, this is a sort of uh, style. And that, you know, these styles also come uh, uh, originally from China, but what becomes more pronounced in their work yeah, is the fact that there is this object. There is this object, and there are trees around it, and there are, I can't believe, and there are still these spots. So it's not what you see, it's not what the object to the object that you understand the space, but because of the things that you think they are, are hidden away from your visual uh, perception. And that uh, makes a very unique uh, Japanese perception. And it's not because it's there, because it's not there that you begin to understand what the space is. Now, so I mentioned that these sort of distance uh, you know, mountains, etc. There was one uh, place, mountain, and everyone knows Mount Fuji, and that is obviously the tallest. And uh, later, uh, especially when the capital moved to Tokyo, Edo, uh, the, the image of Mount Fuji in the distance as a sort of spiritual connector of all these different parts, different activities, different regions, uh, that would, uh, you know, that would become a sort of spiritual core. There is a Mount Fuji inside of this uh, island that is surrounded by the sea, begins to take on as a more uh, sort of a Japanese civic uh, uh, perception of how space and the city's work. And here is a contemporary view of Mount Fuji, and as you all know, the uh, oak size prints uh, that depict Mount Fuji's view from all these different uh, 36 sceneries depicted a different lifestyle. Uh, there's a way when I mean, you see the people in the, on the boats, and then this uh, is another uh, river view, and uh, Mount Fuji is always somewhat in the distance, and that sort of you know, uh, epitomize the, the Japanese, Jap Japanese mess, so to speak, during that period. So in one of these places, you come across with uh, a pond like this. It's a very peaceful pond, and you're a poet, and you're trying to come up with a poem, and you are a high poet, and you write something like this. An old pond, a frog jumps in, the sound of water. This is by uh, Basho, and this is one of the sort of most <laughs> essential and famous haiku from the period. So you can sort of see that. If, where is this frog? Is a, did you see the frog right here? You know, is that why you think you heard the noise because you saw it? 
or you really didn't see uh, the frog, and you don't even know where the frog is, but you heard the sound. And so not because uh, the object that happened took place right at the spot, but because of the resonance of the sound and the atmosphere that again creates a sort of uh, uh, more psychological uh, boundary of space in Japanese mind. And uh, the sound takes on a bit of a more traditional, different kind of traditional perception, and that is, some of you may, may know that this is a, a little little device, it's called Shishiroshi, originally, uh, the literal translation is, it's a sort of you know, scare, deer scare. And what it does is the water would go through this thing, and at the end of this uh, bamboo thing, when the water is a uh, fall, well, uh, this is going like that, but if, when the go, water goes full then, it sort of pours the water out and then swings back, and that's when uh, this step makes a sound, and that, uh, that step is there. And so you know that this is going on, but you don't necessarily know when it's going to, and when it's going to happen. And uh, the, like I said, not the time when you heard the sound, but the time, the anticipation after you hear the sound and the resonance is when in the Japanese mind there is a space that is created or connecting yourself, your consciousness to the surrounding. And usually these devices are uh, hidden away so you don't really see you know, when it's going to a sink back, etc. And <clears throat> this is one of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the gardens that uh, have those devices and then you'll be sitting down there enjoy the view, enjoy the water, contemplating the world, uh, landscape in front of you, and, and then you'll be hearing that the, the sound of Shishiroshi. And then when you turn back, this is actually the room. Uh, and this uh, room has this, uh, you know, the, the Fusuma, this uh, 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 panel paintings by the famous painter, and then that depicts obviously, as you can see, four seasons. And in the Italian Renaissance, we know that there are some villains, so to speak. Uh, for instance, they will be depicted in four seasons, uh, different seasons. But in Japan, it's not necessarily about the sort of celebration or the reality of the season that comes into play. It's more stylized, it's more symbolic. So uh, when you are in this room, which with the bamboo, etc., and that is obviously about the summer, but you are not going to be looking at the bamboo when you are in the summer. You will be looking at those Pusma, uh, these are paintings, when it's really cold, uh, during the winter, etc. And then be able to again make a connection uh, between your consciousness and the hidden time or the space that you uh, were somewhere you know, uh, six months before or after. Now, so that brings up this interesting uh, unique point about time. <coughs> uh, they said the time about this, you know, from uh, jumping moments or from one sound to the next sound, etc. Uh, uh, the, the time plays a uh, big role in the Japanese uh, perception of space. And then that, we can say, this is sort of, a, you know, uh, we can say that not in the case of that Ivan made him, but in the case of this, uh, she is her name, oops, I'm sorry. She is Anna Terrison, and she's the daughter of those two babies you saw. And she had a brother, and he was just crazy, and they didn't get along, and so he, uh, she decided to hide herself in behind this uh, rock. She was, she happened to be the, uh, the, 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 the goddess of the sun, so the whole world became completely dark, and these other people, and others, and the uh, minor gods decided that they have to do something to get her out of here because now the world is completely dark. So they did a wild party in front of this uh, cave. And because of the sound, she opened the crack to open this uh, uh, rock. And then that's when the sunlight started coming in. The world was you know, uh, peaceful again. That moment, that when she opened that uh, uh, 
rock actually is understood as the very beginning of the time for Japanese sort of not the new factual history, but that's when Japan actually became a country and had all these you know the world static. <coughs> now is a shrine <coughs> uh, is the place where uh, Amaterasu is uh, uh, she is the goddess of that uh, shrine. This is a, the, the most sacred, most ancient uh, place of all in Japan, and it's surrounded obviously by uh, sacred uh, forests, etc. Now, when you go, <coughs> you would be uh, taking this bridge over a river, and this is Tori, and this is a, a little gate, and then you cross over this bridge, this is a river, and you uh, come to this uh, place where you have to wash your hands and squint your mouth. You know, to make yourself clean, and then you keep walking into this forest, and you come across another bridge, uh, and you go through another gate, and then uh, you go through these uh, sort of uh, giant trees. Uh, the sun is sometimes sparse, it sort of feels very sacred, and then you finally you come across with this place, and then you climb up uh, the stone steps, and this is where you come in. Uh, in fact, that, that this view. By the way, it's not usually, uh, here's a gate. Sorry, there's a gate, and this is not usually where you can go in. Especially this here, beyond this, the, the only people uh, who have the reason why they can go in. Go in. Uh, uh, anyway, <coughs> uh, but the these buildings, uh, inside this is a fence, these buildings don't look like they were from, uh, you know, uh, seventh century, end of seventh century. How come? These are all made of wood, no nail, no nothing. And that is because that uh, from that time on, exactly the same design, exactly the same use of the wood has been used to rebuild the same structure every 20 years. So what? Uh, whenever you go there, the oldest building you can see is 20 years old. And 20 years later, this side, uh, the empty side that sits right next to it is going to become the next side. So uh, the, the reason why I said that, I'm saying this thing is that the history was sort of in the, you know, let's say from the Egyptian pyramid to other stone monument, that there was a desire to make something that would be permanent, eternal. The things don't break, you know, etc. In the Japanese perception of the time, it's about the renewal, and nothing remains forever. So you have to keep renewing, and this is the, the site uh, uh, right next to it. You feel that uh, you know that the, this has had many buildings sitting exactly the same thing, and it's been going back and forth. The next time uh, that this park is going to be occupied is 2013. So if you are interested in visiting that then you'll see a brand new building. Now, that time also <coughs> uh, belongs to a sort of Japanese with Renaissance. I, I mentioned, I showed you this um, uh, court, I saw this court room. They, uh, they are actually uh, sort of quote unquote responsible for this force. There's uh, a lot of sort of components that define what Japanese sensibility is. Not only space, they started writing literature in this uh, uh, manner, and that was uh, departure from China, etc. So they made a huge influence. Now this is again a sort of poem. Um, uh, this precedes, by the way, the high period, but here it is. Meeting on the path, but I cannot clearly know if it was he, because the midnight moon in the cloud had disappeared. Again. It's sort of you know, similar to the frog instance that it's this instance, a split second of she thought it was this young you know, <laughs> man she has a crush on. And she looked back as it him, then the moon came out down the sewer. Again, it's not just an object or a figure that you recognize and create a space, but because of the lack of, or because of the sort of Given the way nature of and the resonance that uh, um, uh, you know, follows after that is a sort of essence of the Japanese spatial perception. And so she wrote this uh, epic, uh, it's called Tale of Genji, it involves many uh, women, 
and the prince, one prince. <laughs> Uh, and then they, they describe many different activities in a very detailed way. So uh, this is a very uh, good study of how those people live in the time. And here is the <coughs> here is a sort of uh, you know landscape from the time, and they are obviously very concerned or uh, involved with uh, creating a sense of uh, uh, the uh, season uh, uh, in the autumn that all the leaves become uh, red, etc. And here is one view from one room in the temple. And in the autumn, you will start seeing a uh, feeling this is really the autumn. Uh, the color. Now, so this Japanese uh, maple tree in some mountains in Kyoto, that they become completely red. It's white and red because uh, they are all, you know, the maple trees. And it's an amazing uh, scene. And in those times, they would lit up the entire mountain Saturday for about a week or two weeks, however long it, uh, it happens. In uh, spring, uh, it's about cherry blossom. The cherry blossoms are everywhere. Um, and when the cherry blossoms bloom, then people would go and have a party. And as you can see, that here is this blue mat uh, that these people are claiming that it's going to be covered by many parties. Later on, but they are probably here the first, and they're claiming that is my party space. And what happens is in a crowded uh, uh, Sunday afternoon when the weather is uh, great, then all these families and the friends would come, and you can see that each mat has that group. And so you may be sitting next to another group who is really rowdy, etc., but you ignore the cause that your boundary, your territory, <laughs> is really defined by your mat, and then the juxtaposition where right next to each other uh, you know, doesn't bother Japanese people. Because how, that's how you kind of define the special territory of this event lasts from now, two hours later, during the time this, uh, this space belongs to us. Kind of. And then that <coughs> uh, sort of uh, uh, sensibility comes from uh, also uh, the image or the perception of the boundary, and this is the area of photograph of Kyoto. Uh, some parts of Kyoto, the whole town was developed according to the Chinese uh, capital design. So it's all grid, but the scale of the, the houses has never changed since uh, those uh, you know, 11th, 12th century. Uh, some of them, so that you see really narrow, uh, deep, narrow townhouses, and they sometimes look like this. And so from the street side, it's narrow, and it's very deep, and it's not necessarily very uh, open <coughs> uh, from the street. But when you go inside, uh, um, um, <coughs> a lot of these houses has a uh, courtyard inside. And partially because that uh, this is, again, the sort of miniaturization of the exterior world within the house, as well as a pragmatic <coughs> uh, very Humid, and uh, as you can see, that the Japanese living is about sort of opening up everything. These uh, glass doors are a later invention. As you can see, these corridors, darker ones, that is a corridor uh, connecting the, the rooms, and this uh, show the screen and some of these paper screens is where the, the uh, articulation between the outside and inside happen. <coughs> And this is a sort of quintessential image of the Japanese living, and you'll be sitting here, and your uh, bed and fruit, uh, fruit on me, those are all stored away, and so you know, depending on the uh, during, uh, course of the day, this table would go somewhere, and then you'll be sleeping here, and you open up in the morning, and you start seeing the, the, the landscape. So this idea of this plain, you know, vertical surface, not the door, but the entire wall opens up, closes, Etc. Uh, uh, plays a big role of the Japanese understanding of here is a territory, and then you sort of step into the next territory uh, by the sheer, uh, you know, visible or invisible uh, uh, presence of of that uh, spatial boundary. And uh, so that the, you know, uh, academically we can call that, let's say, threshold. Uh, one example that we can really observe that threshold is, uh, uh, is in a non-theater. And this is one of the examples of uh, traditional, original non-theater. And everywhere you go, it's essentially the same. This is the 
a theater, and this is a bridge that the actors would come out, and this is where the performance happens. People are meant to be looking at the performance from all the different uh, uh, angles, not just uh, straight. And here is this um, way that how no reduces everything about uh, sort of you know, particularity into, let's say, actors or not supposed to make any facial expression. Actors are supposed to be able to present how this facial expression can bodily uh, project emotion, etc. This is an outside node. And National Theater, you see the same structure inside of the building, and this is the typical stage, and this is where the, the, the actor is coming. And the reason why I am sort of showing this is because that uh, you would see the actors start coming into the bridge, and then they would take time before they step onto this, or you may see the actors stepping out, and they will be waiting for their turn to show up. Exactly at this point, when they start stepping into underneath of that canopy, that's when these actors assume a particular role. Um, <clears throat> so the sort of precise uh, definition of what this uh, bridge, the transitional time to the stage, uh, becomes very critical. Also, the other thing I should mention is that uh, there are actors, and there are singers, and there are musicians. They never rehearse together. They rehearse completely separately. The real performance is the only time they come together. So what that means is that every performance is different, the space, is not defined as the size of the same space and the world around the, around the space is created every time differently because they come together. When they step onto the stage, then that's when the space uh, for their performance uh, starts happening. <clears throat> and also, you saw in your threshold the Eastern Shrine bridge, and the bridge is obviously a very important uh, component because it involves the water from this side to the other side. Some of the uh, bridges are really sort of done with it like this. Or in other cases, in a sort of natural uh, garden center landscape, uh, you see the bridge that really is uh, sort of uh, you know, the independent component that are you supposed to, really supposed to step onto this thing, or are you just contemplating the fact that you can go there, but the bridge is really just there uh, to uh, show that the, the sign is connected. To the side. <clears throat> and also the fact that uh, those bridges or the sort of circulation, so to speak, the way the path is never straight is because of the connotation to how these bridges are uh, you know, uh, associated with the flow of the water. And so you see a very intricate way that how the texture and the direction uh, sort of interizing or symbolizing uh, the the, the flow of the water, etc. And in some cases, people will be wearing this. Uh, that makes no sound. Or people will be wearing this uh, 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 wooden uh, uh, sandals. That would make a very sort of cheerful, bright sound, depending on uh, the occasions, etc. And here is a very famous image of Sura Palace. Uh, walk where you can see that these, uh, you know, the stones and then the water sort of flow that uh, geometrically defines how you are supposed to, or you are not supposed to, or you're supposed to be walking through this particular space. And so the square in the direction, et cetera, in architectural terms is called articulation. Uh, it's about dividing up from the, from the, the surface and the space. And Katsura Palace happens to be sort of uh, the building that made an incredibly influential impact on the, uh, the early 20th century European architects. Um, and because of this sort of you know, the whole thing, and then if you know painting by Mondrian, let's say that those, you know, the steel in Amsterdam and the image that the European architects brought back were really sort of tied together. And that, what that meant was that. Uh, uh, compared to the traditional Western building that is in the corner, the stone, brick, they have to have a corner uh, to make a space. In Japan, because of the, the column and the beam, etc., obviously, but there is no clear corner. And that means that the, the uh, sort of boundary between inside being inside or outside, there is a semi 
inside and outside you know, contiguous space that, uh, that was very unique uh, for the modern space. And also, obviously, that uh, because of, uh, well, as you can see, that the construction of a building like this is so uh, you know, totally rational that you have to start out. Number one, that the, the dimension is all based on the three by six almost tatami mass dimension. And the multiplication of that is going to make it the entire uh, sequence of the room. And the rooms are not really rooms, those are spaces. And from the foundation to the beam uh, below the floor and the, the column and the beam above your head, etc., is all lined up uh, with these movable panels occupying in between. So the effect of that really is when you see the space all diagonally. Uh, opening up in the manner that you don't really sort of uh, uh, expect the, the space to be continuous, especially when you see the line of the tummy going from here to there. Is this a separate space, room, or the space goes, you know, flows into the next space? Uh, and that, that is a sort of... Uh, the other thing is that because of that, these windows, where the light comes from, either the light comes from a completely open surface, or it comes from a window like that. So a window in the Japanese traditional building is obviously after you set the cone, it goes uh, you know, at the corner rather than in the center of this wall. So a lot of times the surface uh, is lit from the, the light at the corner, and then that sort of exemplifies or characterizes the Japanese uh, space. And here is a beam plan, and here is a roof uh, structure, and this is what the structure looks like. And uh, from here, and this is not the same building as you can see, these different geometry come together. And it's uh, uh, traditionally, they did not use the nail, steel nail. So the, the combination or the connection between these uh, different components uh, required a very, very sophisticated uh, way that the carpenters figured out how the connection between the post and the beam that, that would occupy into each other so that, for instance, this and that is supposed to become horizontal and nothing happens after this part come together because of the intricate uh, you know, void part and the, the solid part come together. So there is a sort of incredible uh, sense of precision that goes into the construction of this. And of course, modern day, not many people can afford or is interest, uh, are interested in building a traditional building. There is a concrete uh, form here. This is a modern uh, construction to create a wall like this. Tadao Ando is one of the sort of uh, more famous Pritzker Prize winning architect uh, from Japan. And what made him very famous was to create this absolutely minimal concrete shell that uh, made total uh, advantage of these incredibly skilled carpenter to be able to make a form uh, in a very difficult situation like this. And so the dimensions are very, very uh, strict, and everything has to line up. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Now, as you can see that because of that, deep into the room uh, of spaces in Japanese houses are not very, uh, it's rather dark. Uh, so uh, in the um, uh, early 20th century, there were people who sort of, you know, uh, uh, became a bit critical about the Japan uh, building these or forgetting about the beauty of the Japanese space. Uh, Tanizaki, as you may know, um, is one of those people. Uh, and so in his words, that the Japanese essence of the space is not, again, you know, where it's lit. It's in this place where it's sort of in the shadow. That's where, because of the presence of the shadow or the corner, you feel the space rather than the whole space is lit up. And of course, he was referring to things like this, the pottery, that if you really look into the surface of this, then you start understanding, receiving the change, the subtle change of the shadow uh, and the light of the surface. And that's where you really feel the sort of, you know, aesthetic uh, of, of the Japanese speaking. So here is a sort of mm, uh, muted light, so to speak, in the traditional way. And Ando would take on 
that type of uh, sort of perception of the light and the modern building, like uh, this is a chapel, obviously, and this is a cross, and the light is coming from that. Uh, that's the only place in, uh, from the outside you see uh, this, and in the foreground you go from here, and this is uh, where you saw, and the floor goes down. So. Uh, the, the light is not necessarily coming from the obvious or sort of you know, orchestrated way, but it will be coming from the slit from the corner. So that again, when you stand sitting there, it's not that you are looking at the uh, light, but you will feel the light maybe uh, projecting behind you or above you is what makes the, the, the sitting in there. So, uh, so. I guess, you know, consciously <coughs> mythical, appropriate for the program of the space. So here is this uh, cross uh, made into the cut. And here is a black and white image. And if you don't know Chinese character, this is actually an inverted image of the Chinese character that says flower. And this is how it's usually done. Now, in the Japanese ikebana, there are four. <coughs> Not there are four, but. It's not the object, it's not the composition of the flower versus this. But when you think about how these components are again occupying into the space, like here, like this tip of this, how it balances out with the rest of the space is what makes sort of. You know, there are many schools in Ikebana, so I, I can't you know, uh, generalize everything. But the fact uh, that the reason why you will see the Japanese flower arrangement in a very particular manner is because that you're not looking at this and that, or base, et cetera. You're looking at the entire tableau, thinking that the, uh, the edge of the stem may reach out to the space where there's nothing yet, sort of, is the kind of image. So here is that, that sort of spatial imagination. And then this is today's Tokyo Shinjuku. And so how do they re reconcile each other, right? <clears throat> and that, uh, the evening, in the evening becomes this. And that requires a different kind of, I'm going really slow, Mimi, are you watching time? Am I taking too long? Is it okay? okay. <laughs> uh, it comes with a different uh, 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 way of thinking, and that is about the content. And especially in the modern Japan, and especially in the crowd at Shinjuku area, you will see that this says batting center. So the batting center is on top of the garage or you know, something in the middle of the, in the, middle of the downtown. Um, and then you find a building that has this uh, little stairs that would take these people to go up and have your own golf practice field. Um, this idea that these different things can be put together in a concise you know, uh, package can be represented by something like that. This is, a, this is a lunch, traditional lunch that you can buy in the train station. And then they have these partitions. They have all these little different goodies. And they would never interact with go there as a partition so you can enjoy the fish, not uh, smelling like something else. Like that, right? <laughs> and of course, that sense really goes into something like this, right? That uh, the idea that your body is here and you know that I'm surrounded by the safety, I don't really care what happens beyond that because, like I said, during that eight hours of stay, that is the space that, uh, you know, that, uh, that belongs to that person. And the other interesting thing, of course, it comes with, uh, with uh, the density, the image of the density the department store has, well, in the American shopping mall, everything is flat, so you go from here to there, to there or walk horizontally. In Japan, in Tokyo, department stores does that completely vertically. So from the, the, the basement of the food uh, to all these different, you know, you can read this, right? And then there is this uh, uh, men's day spa and the golf school and the rooftop garden. In some cases, they actually have very famous uh, museums on top. So if you think about that, there may be Van Gogh exhibit on the top of this department store and on the ground uh, sub-level, sub you can imagine that these uh, people on the way home, they will be you know, buying all these uh, things all in one building. Here is a, a very dense urban uh, 
uh, area with a miniature sock curve. So this thing about the program, different activities can be juxtaposed you know, the, without sort of influence, influence or compartmentalizing all these different activities into one can be seen in the model contemporary architect Toyo Ito. This is uh, Media Tech, it is a kind of building that has a library, gallery, museum, all these things, TV station, uh, did I say library, right? <laughs> yeah. Right, all uh, stacked up. This is a huge uh, international competition, but the reason why he won, and that made him and his project very exciting, was that he treated the entire building as if this is sort of you know, pancakes, it, stuck on top of each other, and then you would expose all these different activities for the seasons to see that all these different things are happening during the course of the day uh, without saying library has to be different from the gallery, etc. <coughs> and here's a night view, and then you would see this uh, elevator going up and down. <coughs> and of course, the, there was a special uh, treatment for the structure to show that these, you know, rather than a column and the elevator, that the structure going like this with the elevator inside is how he could achieve the sort of um, the, the energy of this uh, juxtaposition. Now, <clears throat> this is almost over, but I just want to add one more thing. I think it adds a little more uh, layer to the, to the talk. Is, this is, here is a piece of a fabric, and it's called for a shiki. And what happens is that the people you would be using that for a shiki, it's not good. To wrap things, different things, gift, or you, know, you go out and buy a bottle of something, or you give a bottle of something as opposed to a box, as opposed to different things, and these are all the different ways how the sheet of fabric can wrap things differently. And these are the results. And of course, as you can see, that it really is about creating that particular space by manipulating one flat surface. Uh, the other example is that when you give a gift or a very special thank you note, etc., these are the envelopes that uh, comes, and uh, you know, there is this uh, ribbon, white and red, signify certain things, and it's tied. And then you open this thing, and you receive the uh, inside, and you tie it back, and you give this envelope back to the people uh, who gave you uh, kind of it's a very symbolic way of uh, conducting the exchange rather than giving something out. There is this uh, you know, component that becomes a mediator between the content and the surface. And this comes with uh, a uh, very stylized theory of how all these things can be done or needs to be done, etc. But of course, that comes in an image of the traditional Japanese clothing, that is kimono, and kimono really is the piece of fabric that will surround your body, one piece of fabric that will surround the body, and then you'll be tying with the, the belt like this. Uh, and, uh, uh, designers like Issei Miyake would carry on that sort of idea that uh, the fabric or clothing is really the first layer of spatial definition articulation uh, immediately surrounding your body. And so the architecture, building, house, city, etc., should become the extension of the similar idea that uh, you know, this is about a different layer uh, over and over. And so, uh, it was a long talk, but uh, when you see, like for instance, origami, you know, being able to create all these things, it's just not the sort of independent uh, craft uh, technique, but it comes with uh, different ways and how the surface uh, can make the space. And of course, Japan is the only place where they would come up with an economic use of refrigerator by creating the cubic Watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end. <laughs>